so, hello. My name is Jiří Olša. I work for Red Hat, as you heard. I work, well, my main duty is to maintain the perf and perf tool for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And this presentation is going to be about some not advanced, but maybe slightly advanced use for perf. I will be mainly focusing on uh, how to do sampling and how to get data from the samples because we can store uh, a lot more data than the common usage of the perf can give us. I will start first with some background like what's event, what's PMU. I will show what's, what's sampling and then I will go what you actually can store to the sample and how to retrieve it from the sample and report it. So as I say, uh, the basic usage of the perf, like for most of the users, as we can see, is to run perf record for some workload, store the data, and do the report uh, just to see where your application is pending most of the time. Uh, using this workload uh, means that you are using a cycles event, which is CPU event, which counts uh, CPU clocks. And it's like the very basic event you can use. <coughs> and I will, I will show you that there are more events and uh, what else you can store. So each event, each event is based in the PMU. PMU uh, stands for Performance Monitoring uh, Unit. Uh, and it's basically uh, the base for the event. It's basically uh, telling the event uh, what to do. Each event gets registered as device in the system. So you can either run perf list to get list of your available events, or you can check uh, in CFFS uh, what events, what PMUs <coughs> are actually available on your system. I'll show you. Uh, this should be common, I believe. Like, those PMUs would differ on different architectures, but the paths, I believe, yeah, it should be common paths. Well, definitely PMUs get registered on each and every system. So, you can see on this system I can use breakpoints, I can use CPU events, software events, trace points, and I can use Ancore, Ancore events. So this is like the very fast way to check what's available on your system. Or you can run perf list to get more details. This slide shows you the big picture, how the PMU actually uh, fits into the perf code and the other kernel code. So basically when you install, when you have uh, some workload running under the perf management, what happens is that scheduler is scheduling task. And there's, the, there's a task for the CPU. It actually calls the perf core. Perf core knows what events are available for the task or what events it should install for the task. And it calls particular PMU code to actually install the event and to take care about the event, like to install it to the process task. Afterwards, the processing goes back to the scheduler and the task is scheduled with the events installed. I will now go uh, through the common PMUs to show you what you can actually use. So first one is trace point PMU. Uh, the trace points PMU, the trace points you can use in perf is actually trace points or events you can use in ftrace. Perf is actually connected to the ftrace background. So anytime you open trace, trace point uh, in ftrace, you're basically doing this uh, using the ftrace. So, to actually see what trace points are available on your system, you can go to the ftrace directory, which is this one, and under the events directory, you will get all the events and trace points available under, under your system. <coughs> there are 
The other trace points are kind of special because they are made from probes. Uh, the Linux kernel has the possibility to insert probe to almost uh, any place in the kernel code. So those are K probes and also just recently added we have a U probe so you can insert probe uh, to user space applications. And we can use this probe uh, probes uh, in the in the perf. But first, uh, we're actually using those probes uh, as they were at trace points. So what do you actually do? You uh, use the perf probe command to insert the probe, and it will it will actually install trace point for you. And afterwards, you can use this trace point. I think I can show you. So let's say I want to insert probe for sysread command. Maybe. Yeah. And the perf probe actually telling you that it adds new k probe. So anytime the system goes through the uh, sysread function, it will hit the probe. It will go to the perf, insert, insert the count, or store the sample, whatever. And you can actually monitor this probe by it actually prints to you the, the command line, how you can use it. Yeah, maybe it will be less after. I just rebooted, so there wasn't cached anything, so I guess. So yeah, I need to be root. Yes, so this way you can actually uh, monitor the k-probes. The u-probes are just similar. You just say you just say x for the binary, and you say let's say this main function. Okay, need to be root. Yeah. So now if I run. Start with this probe on perf. I should get something. Okay. Yeah, the main was executed. So those are K probes and U probes. Moving on to breakpoints. Uh, breakpoints is actually the same breakpoint that you know about. Uh, the breakpoints that we're using for debugging, and it's also possible to use them uh, in perf using the breakpoints PMU. The PMU is actually uh, talking to the, I, I mean, is interfacing the uh, CPU to insert and delete breakpoints in standard way. And the way you specify the breakpoint is uh, like this. You say mem, double colon, the address you want to watch, and you specify uh, what's the, uh, what type of the breakpoint, if it's executable or, or is it read or write. Software events. Software events are sort of similar for trace points. The difference is that uh, it's not connected to ftrace. Software PMUs are ex uh, actually hooks in the kernel code. Like in this example, if there's a page fault and you enable uh, the fault event, Anytime the system, the kernel goes to the path where the this call, it will actually increase the event. CPU PMU. CPU PMU is probably the most interesting one because it lets you do the probably the most interesting uh, stuff. Uh, it produce uh, CPU by itself produce uh, offers you uh, many many events. Uh, those events actually. Uh, groups into two distinct groups. It's first is architectural events, the other is non-architectural events. Uh, the thing is that architectural event is same on the each CPU model. So if there will be new CPU model, you can always rely on uh, architectural events. Uh, the architectural events are like cycles, cache misses, branch misses, just the very common uh, common events, and they are like eight or seven of them. 
The non-architectural events, uh, there are like several hundreds of them for each CPU. And to actually use them, you need to consult, I mean, you need to re read the software developer manual. And how you can actually specify such events. So for architectural events, we have this nice word like cycles, cache misses. And for non-architectural event, uh, we use uh, following, uh, following selector. So each non-architectural event is specified uh, by several descriptor, like event select, unit mask, flag, and counter mask. So when you go to the documentation, you will see the description of the event, and you will see like put this to Avalanche Select, put this to Unit Mask, and you will get whatever event. So what we do in Perf is kind of similar. Uh, each CPU publish the format of this descriptor, and you can specify uh, this descriptor in the uh, dash e uh, dash e option. So the format is uh, exported in sysfs again. So if I go there, yes, it's under the CPU. And if I go to format, so those are basically the descriptor, uh, descriptor names, which you can use uh, in perf, let's say, stat e. I will say I want to monitor cycles, and I know that cycles our event equals 9 free C just for user space for LS. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Thanks. So it's the same as you would type like this. So using following descriptors, you can actually uh, create any, any event that's described in the software developer manual, and it's kind of easy. OK, so this was like the list of I, the, whatever you can, you can uh, get from the system in terms of events now, how you actually measure those events. Perf and probably most of the performance tool work in two modes, counting and sampling. Uh, counting is actually getting you the data for the whole workload, and it's done by perfstat command. So if you run perfstat ls, it will run the ls and give you output like uh, the total number for the event that was measured for the ls command. By default, it will just give you uh, the list of some default default events. As I said, this presentation is uh, about sampling. So from now on, it's only about sampling. And sampling is actually very different to counting. Uh, when you when you run perf record ls, actually what happens? It uh, uh, the record command takes a cycles event. It configures the cycles event to work in the sampling mode. And that means that uh, any time uh, the event is triggered during the workload, the perf core will create a sample, store it somewhere, store it to the data file, and then you can run the perf report to, to see uh, where you uh, got your samples. And in case of <coughs> cycles event, you will actually get some idea where's your uh, program spending most of the time. OK, when, when is the sample taken? Uh, this is kind of tricky for software events and trace point events, because you can actually set uh, the period, like using the dash C option and dash uh, capital F option to set the period when the, how often you want the sample to be taken. But uh, for software events and trace point events, we actually set this period for one, mostly because other setting would just, just doesn't uh, make any sense. But for hardware events, you can say, uh, OK, I'm monitoring cycles event, and I want to make sample each and every 100,000 cycles. So you say they see 100,000. If you want uh, to monitor the samples in a period way, use the dash uh, 
capital F option, and by this you say, give me, give me x number of samples per second. The default for cycles event, if you don't specify anything, is uh, 4,000. I have an example. So I have this program, which is actually doing just busy looping for specified number of second, seconds. If I'm okay, running it with the dash f for two seconds, and I want like uh, one, one, one thousand samples per second, I should get like two thousand samples. So let's see. Yeah, more or less. It matches. The maximum frequency which you can specify is actually guarded. The reason is uh, because you specify how often the perf code should run for one second, in one second, how many times. And you can actually hook the CPU, so we have this. Uh, guarding, uh, guarding number which actually doesn't allow user to uh, go over some uh, predefined maximum, which is 100,000 at the moment. And also we have kind of watchdog. watchdog. Uh, anytime there's a uh, perf interrupt, which is, which is doing the samples, this interrupt is measured in nanoseconds, and if it crosses some threshold, we will actually lower the maximum uh, maximum period you can use. So this is kind of like self-defense mechanism. OK, we know when the sample is taken now, where is it stored? It's stored in the ring buffer. The ring buffer is special for perf. It's, it's, uh, and it's shared with the user space. So the workload for the sampling is that kernel stores the data to the ring buffer. And this ring buffer is uh, shared with the record command in the user space, and the record command reads the data. It reads the data as fast as possible, but sometimes it's not fast enough. So whenever the kernel goes to store the sample and there's no space, it will just throw it away. And in that case, you will get some lost events in your in your workload. You can kind of you can kind of uh, ease it by uh, using the dash m option, which allows you to uh, make the ring buffer large, larger, whatever size you want. This option just got changed recently. Before it was quite pain to specify the size of the ring buffer because the size has many specification. It needs to be like uh, put in terms of pages, and the pages number needs to be power of two. Uh, not now. You can just say whatever whatever size you like, and put the profit uh, suffix like b for bytes, k for kilobytes, and megabytes, g gigabytes, and it will it will create the buffer for you, and uh, you can actually see what was the final size of the buffer if you specify the dash v. This is the size that perf will actually use uh, for the ring buffer. And from the ring buffer, the data goes to the data file. How to read data from the data file? Uh, we have the report command. And the report command uh, actually sorts the data for you. Each sample, I will talk about this, is actually taken at some, at some shared object, some command, some CPU, and a report will actually sort all the samples that were taken based on some default criteria, like based on symbol, DSO. But sometimes <coughs> you just want to see the samples as they go, and we have tool for this as well. So you can say perf report list and you will see how the samples uh, were taken what time and actually what was the what was the period uh, value 
or you can use the perf script or perf report capital D. What is in this sample? Uh, so each time there's a sample, each time the event is triggered, there's a sample, and we store some data to the database, uh, to the ring buffer. And actually, what is this data? So we have a couple of uh, uh, common, common data, which goes like to each and every sample, and then we have some special data which you need to configure to perf to actually store this data. So let's start with the easy one. PID, CPU, when the sample is taken, it's in some PID, it's in some process, it's in some, on some CPU, so this will be stored in the sample so you can sort it later. Period value. Some events, like uh, CPU events, they have the value, right? So, and the value uh, from the previous sample to current sample is the value of the event, and it's the period value. That's what we call in the perf period value. Address. This is probably the most interesting one, an important one. It is the address where the event was triggered. So if I was monitoring like the cycles event, uh, it got overflowed, let's say, in this code, and the address will be the address of the instruction that actually caused the event to overflow. So those were like common, common data which is stored in the samples. Now, not very common data which you need some configuration for. Last branch records. Each CPU, well, probably not each CPU, but some CPUs has, have uh, the possibility to actually start last branches. If you, if you imagine any program, and if you go down to the assembly level, each program is actually uh, composed of branches which are switching amongst themselves by branch instructions. And some of the CPUs can actually uh, remember last branches that they took. And it appears that it's very, it's very handy when we store the sample. We can actually explore those branches because it gives us the idea how the CPU, how the program got to the point where the sample was taken. So in this example, if you go from the main all the way to the test C function, you actually cross uh, C, uh, three branches. And those addresses like from and to, where did you go from and where you jump to is stored uh, in the sample. Uh, by default, if you specify like perf record dash b, you will you will have the branch info stored in the sample, and by default it will be like all branches, so conditional jumps, unconditional jumps, calling instructions, return instructions, everything. You have possibility to specify this J option just to do some filtering, like say, okay, I want only calls, I want only unconditional jumps. The report command for uh, just um, branch report is not very useful in Perf. I'm not going to show it because I didn't find any, any good usage for it. Uh, but branches are, I will mention in a few slides, are very useful when it comes to the uh, core chain information, to the backtraces, which is probably, it will be the main uses for them in Perf. OK, that give us two core chains. This is probably the next very common uh, feature used in uh, Perf. What's going on? Actually, for each sample, you can uh, store the backtrace. Backtrace like all the nested functions uh, that got you to the point where the sample was taken. How to record branches? You just specify dash g or dash dash call graph, and uh, that's it. If you don't specify any option, it will give you the standard, uh, the default way of uh, getting the backtraces. And we have like three ways to get the backtraces. We can use frame pointers, we can use dwarfs, and newly, we can use branches. So each of these methods is kind of special uh, because uh, it's special in a way how much data it stores to the sample, how fast is it, how fragile is it, 
how good data it can it can get you. So starting with frame pointers, uh, frame pointers are actually a uh, compiler option. And if you have frame pointers in your application or in your uh, kernel enabled, each time you nest to the function, there will be like frame uh, created on the stack. And later on the stack, you can use those uh, frames to get back through the stack. And this is the default way for Perf to get the core chain uh, information. So in this example, if I'm taking the breakpoint from the test A function, it will actually run all the frames back from the stack and store it uh, to the database. So for the frame pointers, the data is actually very small. It doesn't take uh, much space in the sample, it's just a couple of bytes. Uh, it's we're just storing addresses. But the thing is that in some uh, distributions, frame pointers are disabled. In some uh, applications, you can disable the frame pointers by yourself. Also, in some architectures like ARM, they don't have this, and they need to use the other way to get the core chains. And the other way is using the dwarf unwind. The dwarf unwind, uh, you can imagine it working like you have a black box, the library that's doing the uh, unwind. It's working. And you, uh, you get this uh, unwind library, the user stack, the user registers, get this unwind library idea what was the uh, address space, like what processes were in the address space, and the unwind library will take all this data and it will produce you core chain. And this is possible because uh, in binaries, you can compile inside so-called CFI information, call frame information data. It actually, uh, it gets instruction for the text code, for the code itself, and it actually monitors how it treats the stack, how it treats the registers. So using this information and user stack and user registers from the, uh, from the sample, you can actually, we can unwind the stack. Uh, for Dwarf, uh, we use it, uh, sorry, for perf, we use it only the dwarf unwind for the user space application. That's why I'm saying user stack and user registers. And the record phase only stores the data. It doesn't do any unwinding at all, so it just stores the data. And later on in the report, report will see, okay, I have users registers, I have users data, and it will call the unwind and produce, produce the uh, call chains. The dwarf is kind of more precise than frame pointers because by using frame pointers you can actually miss some inline functions. By dwarf you don't miss any function because all the records for the functions are in the CFI data so you will get probably all the functions that were on the way. The thing is that the data you need for dwarf is very large. The default for the stack that we use uh, is eight kilobytes, so for each sample you store, uh, and using dwarf unwind you have like plus eight kilobytes of the data, which is kind of a lot if you have many samples. Okay, I will give you an example how to use it. So normally you would say this G, and if you do this V, you will see that whatever whatever we used was frame pointers, FP for frame pointers, and for dwarf you can you actually need to use call graph equals dwarf and you can specify the size. No, not call graph. No. Ah. So you can say call graph dwarf number of bytes you want to store for uh, each stack, and that's that's what you get. Branches, as I mentioned before, the uh, standard uses standard report for branches is not very helpful. But <laughs> what's helpful is using branches uh, in call chain information. So as I said, we record 
at the time when the sample happened, we store all the branches that actually happened before the samples. And this is just recent work from Andy Clean. Uh, we can use this information, these pointers, and actually so show them uh, uh, as a call chain information. So it's actually more, more detailed. It will give you not just the functions, but it will give you like the jumps in the functions. Very helpful. And of course, using the backtraces, um, we use them for a long time, so we have many options to actually uh, uh, to actually show them in a, a nice way. So when we sort samples, we also uh, merge together uh, the backtraces, so it will show uh, in one way under one sample, and we have. Uh, many, are, many are report options like you can sort only for, uh, let's say, only for core chains that have, uh, that have some regular expression inside. I can actually show you this one. Record ABC. What ABC does is just nested function and the uh, most inner function is doing the busy loop, and it's called from two places, the C and the D. Okay, I need to record the call chain, and what you will see that we merge uh, those big traces together. So most of the samples were taken, like all of them were taken uh, in the test A functions, and we merge the uh, we merge the. Uh, back traces. The other uh, new, very useful uh, option contributed by Namyung King just recently uh, is that we don't store the, we don't show the back traces by themselves, but each part of the back trace we treat uh, as a equal sample. So you can actually see on the self column you will get uh, the data from the from the function where the sample actually happened. But you also get uh, the symbols where the sample didn't happen, but it was the core chain information. It was actually sort of in this function as well. So that's when you specify the chain and some other options. Memory profiling. Uh, just, it's not recent option, but it's quite new. We can profile memory accesses and memory storages. Uh, we have special uh, special events for that, which are not available on each and every system. I will show you in next slide. But basically what we do, uh, for each store, we store the address on this, in this instruction where the store or load happen, of course. That's what we do for each and every sample. But we also store the address of the data, like where are we, where we stored and or where did we read from. And we store the type of the access. So at the end, at the report phase, you can see, OK, those were my stores. Those were my loads. And those stores went to level one, level two, or uh, any other kind of cache, or even to the, uh, to the memory. To actually use this option, uh, you need special events, uh, mem loads, and mem stores. It's not available on each. Uh, on each CPU, and to actually see where it is, uh, you need to have those two files. Uh, this is the this is the uh, device uh, file device directory for the CPU PMU, and under the events, uh, we store the most common uh, events you can use. Uh, for the uh, for the PMU, so if you have mem loads and mem stores under this directory, you can do you can do the uh, memory profiling. You can use we have a wrapper, memory wrapper. You can use perf mem uh, record and specify the workload, and it will the report will produce you uh, produce you, uh, the report of the memory accesses. I need to move on. Okay, I will skip this one. 
I don't have much time, so this is the cool way to actually study the kernel sources. You can uh, run the ftrace function, uh, which is used uh, in the ftrace, is very, I mean, it, it gives you uh, the trace from the kernel code. So anytime there's a uh, function executed in kernel code, this function, uh, this event is triggered, and we can store it, and we can uh, see it afterwards, like the flow uh, of the kernel, uh, kernel path. So you can run it like this. Is function. Yes. Okay. So I run ls and I instruct uh, to actually uh, monitor all the functions that were uh, run in the kernel code. And what I can do afterwards is just to run the script, and uh, you will see the you will see the code flow. So it's very useful when you want to study some kernel paths like for sysclose, close, you will just you will just open your sources and actually see what happens, see what actually happened in the in the code and check up with the sources. That's what ftrace function does. Yeah, so all the code I use today it's not yet upstream. Well most of it it's in the main path tree from Arnaldo. The branch traces was just recently sent. Uh, the children option for the back traces, it's not yet in upstream yet. And the trace point report, I didn't show you, it's not in upstream yet as well. I will just finish with the contribution. You can always contribute. You can report back or send a patch. We have Linux perf users mailing list. And we try to answer questions there. As for the documentation, we have main pages. Uh, you can use the software developer manuals for Intel and AMD processors. And we have some uh, wiki stuff and some to-do list if you're interested to actually contribute. OK, I guess that's it. Your question. Sure. Yeah, so anytime there's a sample, uh, there's a, actually for hardware events, there's a NMI interrupt. And before we do anything with the sample, before we actually disable uh, the counters. So when the sample is stored, there's no interaction with the, with the perf code. Yeah, we, we switch the counters off. Yeah, it's totally disabled. Yeah, that's possible only using the ftrace interface. It's not possible in the uh, in the perf by using the perf. You can if you use the ftrace itself. If you go to the um, ftrace directory and put there the F function plugin there, you can do some filtering there. For the for the perf, uh, I don't think the filtering is possible. You just need to adjust your workload, <laughs> so it's. Not running. Okay. Well, I think the overhead of the perf code is quite small. I know about some guys which actually run the perfs all the time on production machines. And uh, the complaints are not about that it has the overload. Uh, well, you need to take care of uh, what you are doing. Uh, because as I said, if you set the period to hide, the code will be executed exact amount of time you set, and it can go bad. And if, 
if you store like uh, for the dwarf unwind, if you want to store large pieces of data in your samples, the code will spend a lot of time doing this. So yes, it can has big over big overload, but it can be configured. Sorry. Yes, sure. I didn't mention it. Uh, you can actually run like perf record dash p and whatever PID you like, or you can you can basically attach it to anything, even to the CPU or C group PID, TID, whatever. Yes, I think I have it on this slide. So basically, where task is scheduled and it has the perf events installed, they will be enabled only for this task. It's not like influenced by any. I can trace only one task. Always. Yes. I can mix it, like monitor two different things at the same time. No, you will have just uh, whatever you attach the perf to, like PID, TID process, yeah. it will just be for. Like doing two perf session in parallel? Oh, yeah, yes, you can. Sure. Sorry to interrupt, but we are already minus two minutes, so if you have any further questions, you can ask them. Okay. to uh, profile my uh, C applications okay. and uh, what it gives me uh, and I use Colgraph and it gives me perfect uh, like a profile but it's by CPU time and I know if you have a trick how to do it by uh, wall time 